Now you have to think inside the box because everyone else is thinking outside the box. Yeah. The future is right now. You want to write songs for life, not for radio. Success should be wherever you go on the planet, they're playing your song. Always dream big. There's no dream too big. The Black Eyed Peas, you are on the record with Fuse. On the record. How are you guys doing today? Good. Good. Chilling. Great. Yeah. Great. New York state of mind. Four people come together to form something bigger than, you know, it's like one plus one plus one plus one equals more than four. And I want to understand right away what it is that each person brings to the table, personally and musically. Taboo, tell me about Fergie and her part of this quartet. You know, Fergie has brought a lot of rock and roll. She brought a lot of strength, a lot of uh, inspiration. She brings a lot of laughter, great voice, great to, uh, to look at for all the fellas. You know, she's a great dancer. Aww. As you can see, she's always dressed to the T, looking beautiful. Can we move to the next? Because this is making Fergie, me embarrassed. Is, I'm just feeding her <laughs> Thank ego. Thank you. What does Apple the App bring to the mix? Apple the App is like the funniest brother that you could have. He's very humble, he comes from humble beginnings. He came from the Philippines and was adopted in America at age 14 and had a dream with Will I Am to uh, become a rapper. I mean, he's amazing. He lets me crash his parties and order the whole menu of room service. <laughs> and That's what's up. <laughs> he rarely gets angry, but when he does, he's very strong about it. <laughs> what, what, why? But he picks his moments. So, Apple, tell me about Will I Am. Will, um, the leader, his mind is always going, really focused when he wants to like do something. A great friend, always looking out for, you know, everybody. Hyperactive, and um, always thinking uh, outside the box. That's definitely true. Will, tell me about Taboo. He's the most courageous out of us. He's uh, a fighter. I, I gotta go back to when we first started the group. We were all intimidated and shy. His ability to get the crowd going. All he did, all he was doing, like, you know, he didn't even say it. He just did it with his arms. I'm like, dude, how'd you do that? <laughs> right? Yeah. Watching dude, wrestling. Like, Watching Hulk Hogan. <laughs> 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 Tell me about the beginning. I listen to it and I think about a DJ set. The songs are kind of like soundscapes and they morph and there's changes within them. And it seems like something that you could just give a DJ and the DJ could just let it rock and you're just gonna crush the party. Right after our monkey business, you know, we sold like 12 million albums. To do the next album, the follow-up, the end, three years later, we're like, how are we gonna compete with selling 12 million records when there's no record stores. But you feel like you have to compete with yourself? No, 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 you have to, you have to, you know, smell what's happening out there. You can't just walk up in a room and assume that it's the way it was when you left. But you're talking about a business shift, not even a musical shift. No, but it's like business has everything to do with, with what it is. So now that there's no record stores, and there's no measuring system on what success is. Success should be wherever you go on the planet, they're playing your song in some club, club or yeah. some restaurant or some basketball game or some wedding, wedding some, you know, <laughs> quinceanera, <Bar> something. <laughs> you want to write songs for life, not for radio. You really do write songs for life, for celebrations. Yeah. You know, it's always with you guys. Let's light up the night. I had the time of my life. Don't stop you know, the party. Don't stop the, tonight's <laughs> gonna be a good night. And I think that's the reason why it resonates is authentic. Because those cats that say they go out, the fools don't be going out. Because we acknowledged and uh, realized the state of culture, the end sold 12 million records with no stores. Even without radio, your records are still ubiquitous. I still go to the basketball game hear it. I swear. I hear it on a commercial. It's life. You're scoring life. So you can score a movie. See, that's what you're trying to do, to score life. Yeah. And a, and a lifestyle as well. Yeah. You talked about the end got to 12 million. Yeah. What is the beginning at? 
the beginning is going to be measured on other things as you aggregated eyeballs and people going out there listening to it. Not the billboard it. numbers, but other things. Other numbers, merchandise, touring, partnerships, things like that. So the beginning is acknowledging the era that we're in now, where I could make a song attached to some platform and 20 million people could hear it in an hour. That's powerful. I mean, talk to me about how it is that you guys make monster hits. We just get in a room and say, let's make a monster hit. <laughs> let's do it. Actually, you do that. It is right. First, a monster hit for what? Club monster hit? Radio, just like a mid-tempo monster hit? So first you have to identify what type right. of hit you want to make. And then after that, you have to go participate in those areas, go and feel what it's like. Testing the water, seeing what DJs are rocking to, seeing why people get up on their seat. What was it? Was it the lyric? Was it the, the, the synth? That yeah. What is it? The is build. it the beat? Is it the build? You, you're watching people like react to things and they react to the build now. That's, that's, the, that's, that's, the, yeah. the, that's the thing right now, yeah. is builds. Peaks. That's our and next song, is, is Don't Stop the Party. That's yeah, a build yeah. song. The thing about it is the beginning, Will actually tested some of these records before we even created the record. DJing it. Yeah, oh, yeah. DJing yeah. it. Yeah. Like, like I remember you, hearing, oh, I... Yeah. And I was like, what's up, Will? If you made a beat and you played it and they walked off the dance floor, that ain't the stuff you come with. <laughs> <laughs> but, always, but always dream big, you know? There's no dream too big. You're... Smashes, and I would think most smashes, not really about lyrics in terms of the verses. It would be about, right, the song, the structure, the dynamics. No, it depends. Like, Where's the Love is about the lyric and, and the sentiment and what it's about. But a song like Boom Boom Pow. So you can't, but those are different things. Boom Boom Pow is Boom Boom Pow. How do you make a song work in every single country and they don't speak English, right? So less is more in that theory. So it's about the beat and how the beat makes you feel. And the thing about it is we're celebrating upliftment and, and joy and happiness that people feel. If you're feeling down and you put on a song that makes you want to dance, that's a positive thing. So much music, I can tell you're from the South, you're from New York, especially hip hop. You're from LA, you're from just outside of LA. You guys are this global sound. I can't tell where you're from, right? I mean, just, you sound like you're from the future. That has to do with how we were brought up. I don't want to say the word representing because it's so, cliche, but representing Los Angeles, what it means, you know, where you have Mexicans here, Persians there, Korean, little Koreatown, little Tokyo. So it's this melting pot to where we, we I like Sly and Family Stone. What? I like Steely Dan too. This is one of the few groups in the world, well, at least in American music, that's multiracial. Most groups are all white, all black. That's very rare. Sly and the Family Stone was like that. They, they were, and they were pioneers like that. Yeah. It wasn't intended, yo, we're gonna be the multicultural band. Right. You said before, music is math, and you really have theories on understanding how to do the things you do. There's no accidents that you're making these hits. You know how the sound is impacting the brain. For a while, hip hop was, that was the business. I don't think it was accidental that the rapper with the higher pitched voice was the one that was the hottest. And now dance music has replaced the rapper with synths or that, that high frequency. People are geeking off of music with no vocals on it. It's no different than an electric guitar solo. Like why did that just screech out? Or the bugle, you know, that high frequency or alarm clocks, fire engines. It's a certain frequency that wakes people up. So you think about that when you make your music. Bass is so delicious, and we always love those crazy bass lines. So how does that fit in within the high frequency? Let's take I Got a Feeling, where the bass line is uh, the guitar, right? That freaking shake, bam, bam, bam. As one is here, hitting eight notes, you have a 16 note bass. So where do you rap when every single hole is filled? When I approached the vocal, I was like, okay, I'll have, I'll insert logos instead of verses. Tonight's the night logo. Let, let's live it up. Right. I got my money. So you're putting poof, pillars within this pulse of eight notes, 16 notes. Less is more. 
So you're allowing the instruments to dance right. when you place these little chants there. Take me inside the Black Eyed Peas songwriting process. Is it everybody in a room together? Well, we have different rooms. There'll be one room where Fergie will be working on something and Will and you know me and App are doing something and then we switch rooms. What do you call it? The factory, right? Yeah, it's like a factory. You know, sometimes I'll just go into a room and we'll play a beat or he'll play like three different beats and I'll just go freestyle on top of them, you know, and, and we'll find the magic moments and make it into something, you know, and that's, that's how some things start. Other things for me, um, some of the, 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 the deeper uh, lyrics, I, I think I'm a better writer when I take the music home with me. Songs like The Situation, which uh, Apple had given me, because Will is hard about getting tracks to take home. You know, he's really... You don't want anything to leave a studio. Right. It's a different era. Because the last thing you want is an idea that's not finished yet. And it's in your hard drive. And somebody has got a hold of it and throws it around the internet. Now you, that song is gone forever. That's the worst thing. Does everybody write their own lyrics? Or do we kind of trade and switch around a little bit? Well, Mix we treat up. the song like a child. Yeah. It's not important who writes it as long as the contribution is making the song a better song. Like, sometimes we'll be just be like, you got lyrics to go? Like, oh, yeah, I do. And, then and the thing about it is that uh, we're very, um, very keen on constructive criticism. You know, the fact that we, we trust each other's opinion enough to say, you know, oh, maybe, okay, you're right, I should do this this way. You know, and that's the, the beauty of, of, our, of our synergy in the studio. And the final outcome doesn't mean we've all agreed on everything. Of course. Some are compromises and just, you know, you just gotta live with that. Well, we, like for example, we might disagree on like how much auto-tune is put on certain things. Yeah, you guys really? are interestingly totally embracing auto-tune at a time when other people are like, Argh. I could see why people bash auto-tune if a singer doesn't know how to sing, doesn't write a song, doesn't produce a song, and gets up there on the microphone because he or she's attractive and knows somebody at the label, they have a great freaking career. That, that's not cool. But say for example, you're a producer and you wrote a song. There's no one to sing it, but you want to sing it yourself. Auto-tune allows you to help you do that. Talentless right. auto-tune, I, I don't agree with. Right, but let's talk about the whole futuristic thing. I mean, we see it in the music, in the videos, in the lyrics. You know, Will's very keen on technology. Will's always um, thinking ahead, so is Apple. The fact is, is that we created that synergy with the imagery and and the music, the videos, and everything that goes hand in hand. I mean, who's to say what the future's gonna look like? All the things we thought the future was gonna look like in the 80s, we're actually doing it right now. Computers beat the Jeopardy champion. Crushed it. Can you imagine a day where the computer would make an album all by itself? We actually did a video like that. Could you foresee that in the real world? Like, wow, we had the number one album last week but, you know, the computer knocked us off the chop of the charts this week. See, I, w I wouldn't like that. Yeah. I think it's the combining of that, that human quality yeah. and how you utilize technology that is the magic. Like, for example, uh, the Roland drum machine that had the Samba preset in it. People played to that. That was a computer. In the beginning of, uh, what's that Blondie song? Heart of Glass. Heart of glass. That little beat in the beginning, <laughs> that's a computer. That little drum looped throughout is playing tighter than a drummer. Right. But it was intermingled and, and meshed with live musicianship and, and artistry. So it's the combination of technology and natural human interpretation and expression. Anything else, I ain't down for that. You worked with Michael Jackson in the last few years of his life. What was that like? One time he called me on Father's Day and said, uh, just want to wish you happy Father's Day. I said, you, you, know, you know I don't know my dad, right? He was like, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, if your kids, I was like, I don't have kids, Mike. He was like, well, happy Father's Day to your mama then, right? <laughs> I was like, you calling my mama then? I do. So, but we were friends, right? We, 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 we would just laugh and joke. You guys were in the studio together, right? Yeah, the dude was a perfectionist. We were doing, um, I want to be starting something. 
And he was like, it was the remix. And he was recording the vocals at my house. He was saying, this song's a shredder. So he tuned his vocals for three hours to record a part that took 10 minutes. That's, that's what it was like working with Michael Jackson. Perfectionist. Perfectionist. Professional. Dude was something else. Did you help mend the fence between him and Prince? Prince had called and invited me to perform with him at a club. Shortly after that, Michael Jackson calls me. Says, I heard you in Vegas doing a show. I was like, yeah, we go on at uh, 10 o'clock, you should come. He was like, oh, I don't, I don't know. I was like, I, I could call him and ask him to put you on the list. <laughs> so, uh, Yo, can I have so Michael the, Jackson on the list? So he was like, really, would you do that? So then I called uh, Prince's assistant to make sure that Mike and his guests got in through the back so, and to be expecting them. Of course. Because he can't just roll up through the front, right? In line. <laughs> I'm on the list. <laughs> so I was like, you know, to be expecting Mike. So then I called Mike and told him that, you know, everything's arranged, there's a section, there's a table for him. Yeah, so that, that happened. But was there a rift between them? No, no riff. I mean, Prince was playing some riffs on the bass. <laughs> <laughs> you guys were in Tokyo filming Just Can't Get Enough video just a week before everything changed there. Tell me about the Tokyo you saw. We always loved Japan. We all agreed to film the video in, in Tokyo, guerrilla style. That hotel room was my hotel room. <laughs> Japan is beautiful. Tokyo is a beautiful city, great people. People are so proud of the service they provide for people. America, we could learn a lot from Japan. If you work at a coffee shop, if you drive a cab, if you're the trash man, that's important. I want to get in one more thing before we wrap up, which is that September 11th, 2001 was a big moment for you guys, and it changed the direction of the group. Talk about that, and are you still on the path after that point. Well, I remember that day, um, I was still sleeping. We were up in Bodega Bay, um, <laughs> Northern Cali, um, um, recording Elephant. And uh, Will rushed into my room. He's like, Dab, scoot over. I'm like, what, what, Will? He's like, Dab, I'm scared. I'm like, why? He said, turn on the TV. We turn on the TV and we see, you know, the airplane going through the, through the, um, <sighs> through the building. We, we're supposed to go on tour September 12th. Right, the day after. But we didn't know September 11th was going to happen. We packed up the studio. Drove back to L.A. But we still went on tour. My grandma was like, Willie, when God calls you to do his work, you don't stay at home afraid. If the tour was supposed to be canceled, it would have been canceled. You got to go out there and do what, what you're supposed to do. So a week after the tour was finished, we wrote Where's the Love. We started noticing, especially in New York, there was kind of a separation. And... Uh, we, were all, we kept on going from place to place, asking the question, where's the love? And then, and then there you go. You can check out more of this right now on fuse.tv slash black eyed peas. Thank you so much, you guys. You guys are awesome. Mm -hmm.